Um, yes, our next uh, uh, speaker is Mehdi. Um, yeah. uh, I'll let you ask something. What's your name? Uh, Mehdi. 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 All right. Okay. You are, um, you are, you are, you are a specialist in, uh, you are an expert in applied linguistics. And uh, you come from Bordeaux University. Yeah. From Segal University, where I graduated in like, BA at Bordeaux and then I moved to Hungary. Okay. And now I'm doing PhD in Hungary. Right. right. Do you need uh, this? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this one. Okay. So yeah, the, the title you see on the uh, on, on the book, I changed it. I didn't change the content, but I thought it was really too concise, and I wanted to make sure that people know where they are coming from. But it was not taken into account. So the title is actually this one. Yeah. Okay. Is the role of education in the discourses of the European Union and of alternative schooling institutions. So my, my claim, I will start with that, is that there is a project called Democratic Education that will provide means for learners to transform the world they live in according to their own interests, in contrast to uh, what we can see today in the mainstream education. So in Europe, such a pedagogical project is foreclosed by the current neoliberal discourse of the European Union. But there are possibilities of resistance, and there are institutions that are resisting actually the European neoliberal project. So uh, the focus of this discussion uh, should be on the extent to which people may self-identify with the neoliberal discourse of the European Union. Because even if one is critical of it, the argument and these positions have been interiorized to some extent. So um, for me, actually what raised my awareness is that um, I, in Hungary I, there was some kind of protest in the university and uh, there is an independent Hungarian university organization called Targato Igaroza, like the student network, and they argued against the policy of the Hungarian government that, uh, on education that uh, was going to force students to sign a contract uh, to stay in the country in exchange of uh, exemption from tuition fee. And um, well, it's especially for, uh, for instance, productive, seeing productive uh, majors, so like uh, medicine or engineering and this kind of thing. And what was written in that, um, in that flyer of this uh, union, basically, was that the student contract also violates the European Union's fundamental rights, especially the basic principle of the free circulation of workforce, included in the Lisbon Treaty. So this is really, uh, it's invested in, the, in ideology because first, the free circulation of workforce is only implied in the Lisbon Treaty, for instance. It's articulated in the ideology of the free circulation of people, which is a bit different than the circulation of workforce, but that's actually what it means. And then, Second, the, a very important part was omitted in this uh, argument was that the full statement of the European Union is actually the free movement of people, goods, services, and capital. So the selectivity of the student union shows that still we are dependent on the European neoliberal framework of thinking, although we are not necessarily aware of it and of the implications. So, in order to explore uh, how to challenge uh, neoliberal discourses on education and how counter hegemonic uh, educational discourses and practices consist in, I will first define an outline of what uh, democratic education should look like with focus on critical literacy based on the practice of democratic education in contrast to market education. That's the first step. The second is like I'm going to discuss the way the power relations of the late capitalist systems of neoliberal capitalism at the European and local level shape the discourses on education in the text that I have chosen for my analysis. So it's, uh, they are uh, from the Europe 2020 um, strategy. And uh, then I will analyze this, uh, I mean, I will give example of uh, the most telling uh, example, uh, aspect of uh, the representation of neoliberal discourse in the European Commission's text of the strategy 2020. 
that uh, should shape the educational practices at the moment at the European level because they are seen as desirable. Uh, so I will expose the ideological investment of the European uh, Union and uh, against the practices that will be also like the second part of this last part of uh, two alternative school educations, which are the first one is the summary school in the UK and the second one is the Paris self-managed high school, which is uh, it's a state institution I and mean, they are relatively free to implement their own practices and until they allow students to finish their like, high school. So they, these are instances of counter discourse in their and they resist the neoliberal discourse on education. Within a broader um, resistance against oppression, basically, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the aim. So then, I will first give you an outline of democratic education with a focus on critical literacy. So there are different understandings of uh, literacy. The first one is the mainstream one. The dominant logic is the literacy myth. So according to this, literacy is a skill. If you acquire the skill, you are securing economic development, individual advancement. In other words, I mean, this literacy has, is, is aimed at containing the person acquiring the skill in the status quo of the society, rather than liberating uh, the student from the dominating logic. So this is what uh, Paul Freire wrote a long time ago in the 1970s. Like, this is the containing against the liberating pedagogy. Uh, and then there is critical literacy. So critical literacy comes as a revolutionary and liberating pedagogical action. So it, it would result in a, in a schooling in which the participants um, can reflect on their lived experiences through developing a critical awareness of the textual production of life. So how does it look like? Um, Briefly, it, con it can consist and it should consist in the reappropriation of the priorities in the classification of subject. So, compartmental education is, uh, should be challenged in order to fight class inequalities that are perpetrated uh, by education and to allow the learners to understand reality as changeable and changing, of course. Um, and then the second thing is that students should be empowered through creating a space for them to make decisions on how and what they learn. So it would mean that the education process should take place in an environment that favors uh, cooperation about competition, for instance. So competition is really the ultimate value of the neoliberal logic of education. And uh, competition, according to Bernard Lecou and Samuel Delcom, who wrote a book, they wrote a book about um, the new trends of education in Belgium and France, that uh, competition requires the education system to prepare the students, in fact, for the suffering of their future life when they will be judged according to the techno-economical criteria of profitability. So the major principle of liberating education are discussed in detail in Paulo's educational praxis. So the important point here is that this kind of education, democratic education, does not limit itself to making learners intellectually conscious of the world and the relations between the social groups. This, this is emergence only, but also acting upon the world, uh, thanks to the awareness that we gained before and uh, inside and outside the classroom, which is called intervention in the Freifine model. So the school becomes the real of participating in such democratic uh, and liberating practice. So um, this is about democratic education, and more or less clear on that. And um, now I will talk briefly about the relations between the capitalist system, the power relations at the European and local level, and the way that these are embedded in the discourses in education, on education. So but the neoliberalism, late capitalism, uh, I will define it briefly. Uh, Drawing on David Harvey, uh, so it's, it, David Harvey said that it is a, a reconfiguration of the mode of production of capital accumulation that started in the 1970s and um, it needed um, 
to a dominant mode of production called flexible accumulation. Okay, so that's the neoliberal uh, logic in economy. Uh, in the field of cultural production, this is usually labeled as the knowledge economy. Uh, so the various institutions then shape the subjectivities in, accord in accordance to the values of flexibility, lifelong learning. So this is all like neoliberal job. And uh, the text that I analyzed, I just used the methodology of uh, Norman Perkins of uh, critical discourse analysis. Uh, so, for him, the particular ways of representing reality the discourses are shaped by the institutions of production. So, one of the most relevant factors of uh, determine that, that determine whether text has an effect on the institutional uh, changes is the power, the position of power. So, political power of the institution that issues the document is going to influence greatly whether this document is going to have an effect on. Uh, the reality basically. So it's crucial to study the text of European 2020, uh, the Europe 2020 strategy, because they, this is the document that has the hegemony on the educational policies of all those member states, uh, education uh, ministers. Uh, so then, the European 2020, this is one striking, striking thing, is that it silences the few exi existing project of democratic education. Um, so, anyway, they are possible because, as I said, the uh, Saint High School and uh, Somerville are still existing today. But the European Union like, science, yeah, they don't consider that they should be the alternative. You know, they are following the general liberal discourse and strategy. So, uh, let's see. Yes, this is what one text of uh, this is in the European. Uh, Rethinking Education, European Education, part of the 2020 strategy, so let's do it. So, so here, basically, the meaning is that training people in accordance to the need of the job market will solve unemployment. Uh, so this is a myth in the sense that it is aimed at strengthening the power of the employers over everyone in education. Since they are like, unemployment is seen as, as the problem here, and in, in so far as the unemployment is argued pertaining to the youth, in general, it's reasonable to link it with education, according to to this. So the changes in the field of education should now be forced to deliver the right skills. Uh, so, and here also, like all relevant stakeholders, it's ironical because it comes to mean the job market and the employers quite exclusively. Uh, and this is about the broader economic context of unemployment that's quite uh, relevant. Uh, then they look at language teaching. Uh, so, this is their approach to language teaching. <coughs> So here we can see that the content of language teaching should be about the practical and communicative skills because they are the ones that are needed in the context of increased mobility within the, the labor market. So we can notice immediately that international exchanges, uh, they are purely work-related exchanges in this context, taking place through the mediation of the market. So the content of language teaching should according to this logic, uh, focus on communicative skills. So that's how they deal with it. And at the same time, here we can see that it's not about communication, but it's actually understand the task that you are ordered to do okay, and able to perform the task. So um, it's about understanding in order, instead of really communicating. So this is even more direct. Um, so this is, I won't show you more examples of this because it's quite, the whole text is very interesting. But, uh, this is, these are the two, like, the relation between the economy and language teaching that, that I want to emphasize. And then, briefly, to see what the counter discourses might look like, I chose uh, 
two tests, the first one from Summerhill, it's the introduction to Summerhill. And then for the Seven National School of Paris, they published a book for their 20th anniversary, in which they clarify also the, the end, how they see education and the role of education, that education should have. So for instance, this is in the Summerhill, uh, introduction to Summerhill. Uh, So this, here we can see the practice of critical literacy. So asking questions from personal experience, um, teaching democratic experiences instead of letting the textbooks and others impose without debate with authority what one should think, what should not. So this is practice on a daily basis of critical pedagogy, critical literacy. So this is an example of what uh, counter discourse can look like. It's uh, still different than just formatting the student to learn how to fit in the job market. And then in the French context, uh, they talk about skills here, but they, it's like they counter claim it's really not the same kind of skill that they are talking about. So you can see how. The notion, the notion of skill that is so much embedded in neoliberal thinking and discourse can be counterclaimed by uh, this democratic education institution. Uh, so they undermine the claim of transversal skills by turning them into a possible tools for critical literacy that are aimed at actually practicing democracy through debating in their school. So I will conclude. <laughs> so, uh, we have seen that the European Commission conceives education really as a purely utilitarian thing, uh, with a purely utilitarian logic, aimed at adapting the education to the world economy. Free movement is taken for granted, for instance. Uh, and free movement, and until you get the appropriate skills for it, you are going to be finding this work. That's basically their, their message. Uh, on the other hand, the alternative text, they draw from uh, democratic education. It's a practice, so to like, practice at the same time and critical literacy of the theory. Uh, they are an optimistic break from this neoliberal order that's hegemonic right now, because they, stay, they step aside meritocracy. There is no meritocracy. They argue for discourses of democratic participation. Uh, they argue for Democratic decision on shaping the curriculum, for instance. Um, democratic relations, interaction in the schools uh, on a daily basis. So the question, there is one question that remains is, to what extent can such practices be introduced as well? So I think like my personal opinion is that now we are living in a crisis period. So it can be a good moment to try because it, this crisis brings to light the interiorized um, habitus that uh, well, you, the, the workers of education have, let's say. So, although they don't, I mean, the teachers are not going to, to tell the students that they are going to school because the European Union strategy is like this. So, at some point, they can, this crisis make, can raise awareness on what is actually going on. And, um, yeah, so they, they can realize that so far I, they have been, or at least now it's not it's not really it's not working to adhere to the value of individualized achievement, which is just trying to consider the system uh, that is uh, actually in crisis as an effect of such values of individual achievement. Um, so it's it's not necessarily uh, ideal, idealistic because. Um, I will give you a quote of uh, Max Horton, who said about the chances of changing education, that uh, well, there, is a, there should be, in a dialectical fashion, structural changes between the habitus and the economic structure. So there, it's dialectical. So this is the quote. So these structures of society will have to change. We don't uh, change man's heart. It doesn't make a great deal of difference to the people are. Behind the system, they're going to function like the system they are function. 
I've been more concerned with the structural changes than I have with changing the heart of the people. And uh, to quote Spider uh, Chimera <coughs> as a last uh, quote and like, conclusion, conclusion conclusion. So when the revolutionary crisis in power, then revolutionary education will take on another dimension. What was before education to contest and challenge, like what I presented here, the counter discourses, becomes a systematized education, recreating, helping the reinvention of uh, society. So it's, you can see the dialectical relationship between this. Like the practice now and like, changing society as a whole, so it's what to start with first. <coughs> Any question? Yes, this uh, this is the Paris. Yeah. Who's financing it? So the state. And this you is, do? Yeah, yeah. And That's is it the only institution of its kind? Or? There is another in San Jose, which is like in the, on the Atlantic coast. And they are still, they, they were created in the 1980s. When the Socialist Party came into power on the very first year, okay. they gave a lot of money to alternative schooling, and they were not silenced yet. So that's there are still spaces of freedom somewhere out there. Islands, yeah, but they are isolated. So it's yeah. I have a question. Uh, since you're talking about education being, like, let's say, influenced by a neoliberalism and capitalism, and like a place where competition is like, promoted, what uh, do you have some kind of alternatives, like some kind of changes that you suggest? I mean, you said like uh, changing the structure of society, but how? Well, first of all, like, of course, like uh, to go back to the education, like to favor cooperation over competition. So meaning that. There shouldn't be like the race to the top because at the end, I mean, there will be one person at the top of the class and then at the bottom the, all the rest. And this is actually not the right way to to prepare the students to the world actually because this means that. Can I just continue? I mean, yeah. in society, yeah. like competition is promoted, so they Absolutely. are in the job market. If you're the best, you're going to get a job. If not, you're not going to get a job. So how is it not preparing the students? Don't get me wrong, I agree with you, but yeah. I'm just interested in how. Well, I would say that the, the problem is that this competition at, at the level of the job market is functioning very well now, and everyone is like, competing against everyone else. Because before, education prepared them to actually be in that situation and compete at the job level. So it's like interiorized from the very beginning of the education. So you are taught to compete. And then at the job market level, for instance, well, you know perfectly what's your task because you've been taught this all your life in, when you were in school. That you have to be the first and you should like, I don't know, like uh, crush the others and this kind of thing. So at least maybe the little hope is that education, if it stops favoring this kind of attitude, then maybe people realize that way. I mean, maybe it's not in my own interest to fight against everyone else for a shitty job that someone is giving me for the minimum wage. I don't know. So, or, or I mean, even be a manager and crush everyone and everyone else. So, I think, yeah, there is a lot of work in education to, to do. And of course, well, this might help to, like, to put seeds of like, changing then the, the whole mentality of, of people in front of this kind of economic situation. I guess that's what they were. We have a question that is just commentary, but are you arguing now that the uh, education system is like influencing the market processes? How do you say it? Yeah, it's, it's directly. like just the other way around, that market processes are changing how education has to be functioning. And how are we going to escape this? I'm not so optimistic like you are. I don't see a little chance. I mean, this crisis has been going on for seven years. Yeah, and the austerity politics are now even stronger than they were before this crisis. Perhaps one question, where do you take your optimism from? <laughs> <laughs> from? From exactly this kind of 
institution <laughs> that are actually resisting somewhere and that they can like, be imitated still. But there is still something going on, but if it's expanded, it can help to, I mean, it is an optimistic thing. It's a very small thing, but that's, I, I hope that. <laughs> My question is in similar direction. Um, we are usually talking about um, economization of education or neoliberalization of education, which is probably something different. Um, but I think we should also talk about, or what do you think about to talk about um, educationalization of, of, of the economy? So you mean uh, the integration of education in, in the market in terms of yeah. making? Yeah, so, yeah, so we are just we're talking about the educationalization of the economy. Or is it a contradiction? What do you say? I would say that there are two. I mean, it's dialectical. So, the, of course, the economy is influencing the education, so from top down. And then the, this kind of behaviors are interiorized. So, I would say uh, you are going to go to school because your degree is going to be worth something. And yeah, this is like, like it all goes together. I think the economy is like the the engine behind this all, and how it is interiorized from the bottom or pushed from the top. Uh, yes, the resistance should be at every level, and it's very difficult. And that's why also the illustrative politics are how it's really tough to do, because yeah, it hasn't been uh, it hasn't been challenged very strongly. So, but, uh. Okay. Sorry, I'm really interested in this idea. Like I agree with you that usually it is the market which drives the, the education. Like in uh, in the EU recently, there was a attempt to like promote skills. Uh, like I'm not sure exactly, but the friend who's working on like EU um, NGO, uh, they said that they stopped this uh, legislation from being effected. Like which is like basically cutting out education and just promoting skills because this is already like the trend in the in the market. But I'm like, even if you, uh, I do really want to believe in this like optimistic view about education. But even if you like have this kind of cooperation, and in society you have a trend which is uh, promoting uh, competition, how how is it that for this for these students, you know, they're how they are going to uh, fit in, you know, this? But the, yeah, I mean, the point is that fitting in is not the goal of this education. So. <laughs> there is going to be a touch and hopefully they will be and that's what, that's what we are always waiting for actually. So when people stop being like, when are we going to fit in and say that we will never do and we should just fit in all together. And not fit in and like leaving people on the side of the road because they didn't and it's their own fault. And I think this is the problem. That fitting in is the problem. And no, no one, not everyone can fit in, and fitting in means that a few people will, and a lot of people will not. Okay, maybe I just remember this question here. No. Uh, yes, yeah, so even with the fitting in, like there are people who are not fitting in and still manage to be successful because they have certain like, talent, skills, whatever they have. But even like when you think about it, 90% of people fit in and these 10 do not. And those, these 10 like, do not have these special talents, whatever these other 90 uh, have. Like, you know, what? what is for this uh, cooperation? What is going to happen with them? I'm just saying. I'm, uh, yeah, but, I mean, I would say, I would turn it the other way around. I think in this, in this world, it's more like the 10% who will fit in and have like the really great work, great life in the world in general, and you will still have the 98 that will be on the side of the world. And this is the problem, actually, that the minority is is fitting in, and the majority is not. And that, that's the thing. Like, it, I don't think it's a problem of talent or anything. It's just that the world necessitates a minority of people to, to decide to rule it, and the other people will always work for this minority, or just talk, because there is not even work. Thank you very much.